Um, okay. I don't have anything prepared or anything at all, um, and uh, that is because, um, you know, as you know, we're supposed to have Bob Richardson speak on Moon Express, um, and I was personally interested in hearing him talk on that um, because, if I recall correctly, Moon Express and one of the other Lunar X Prize teams um, have a uh, an agreement with a group called Celestis Memorial Space Flights, um, which is an interesting group that basically offers to fly the ashes of your dead relatives and friends and family members. Um, on space missions. They've done a several several missions so far. They've flown Gene Roddenberry's ashes. They've done, um, you know, I believe, I was about to say Leonard Nimoy, but he's still alive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they, they, they've flown a bunch of people. Um, and uh, supposedly um, they had a contract with Moon Express, and supposedly um, at some point my father is going to fly on a mission to the moon um, with Celestis. So, it's an interesting thing that uh, I was looking forward to hearing about. Um, ba basically, I'm just going to ask, what do you guys want to hear about? What do you do? Okay, all right. Um, I guess I'll give the export talk um, or something like that. All right, hi. Um, I'm Clive. Um, I work in Export Aerospace. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. Um, that cell phone is lying right on the core, isn't it? Really going to bother me. Okay, hi. Yeah, I'm Clive. I'm an engineer at Xcore Aerospace. Um, I just uh, I just started there recently. Um, I uh, I work on the Lynx suborbital vehicle, and uh, I'll just kind of talk a little bit about uh, well what we're doing, um, why, and uh, you know how we're doing at it. And uh, if I ever say anything like if I get close to saying stuff I'm not supposed to say, like scream, scream at me. Um, okay, so Xcore has been around for about 11 years now, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it started as a group of engineers from Rotary Rocket um, and, man and a manager from Rotary Rocket. And uh, Rotary Rocket was a team that was uh, basically planning on building a very uh, cool single stage to orbit vehicle that would uh, launch straight up and would come back down and use uh, basically helicopter blades to break itself and land softly on the ground. Um, uh, Rotary Rocket didn't quite make it. Um, but one of the things that did make it out of it was uh, a very, very cool piece of art that we have installed at the uh, Mojave Spaceport, which is a Rotan uh, suborbital test vehicle, um, and uh, also x Aerospace. And uh, I found out about x in a popular science article um, in like 2005 or something, and uh, I, I was just entering into uh, the visual effects industry at that point. Um, and I was reading about this little company in Mojave that was working on something called rocket racing, and I, I read about it. and. You know, so the idea was you get a bunch of pilots and you do pylon racing with rockets, and uh, you know you take a, you, you take an airplane, you modify it, stuff a rocket engine into it, and uh, you would all of a sudden have a really exciting, you know, attendee event. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, and you know, I, I guess I'll, that'd be fun to watch. And then you know that kind of you know disappeared under the waves, and every once in a while it'd pop up, and there'd be videos of it, and I'd still be kind of following it, but I really kind of the name. Always, it was new to me. I didn't really remember it, and uh, it all kind of changed when I ran into uh, one of their engineers, Mark Street, at a, at a meetup group, and uh, he invited me up to visit Export. When I went up there, what I saw was a uh, it's a little hangar on the flight line in Mojave, and you walk in there, you see it's just completely packed full of trailers, and on each one of these trailers is some kind of science fiction-looking assemblage of valves and gears and tubes and knobs and all of them used to have some kind of coffee can sized little thing that actually turned out to be a very sophisticated rocket engine. Um, and uh, when I was up there, they actually fired one of their rocket engines for me. Um, it was a little uh, little engine I gave it around and it shot this beautiful green flame out the back. And at that point, um, this is about two years ago, and I was like, I'm gonna work here. Um, and uh, I basically hustled and ended up working there. Um, now what we're working on now is uh, something called the Lynx. Uh, as you can see, we have a big model of it out there, and I guess that's my visual aid for this unprepared, unplanned for cover talk, um, is that entire vehicle. Uh, the Lynx is a single stage to suborbit, um, rocket powered, uh, horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing airplane. Um, and, uh, oh, are, are, is Doug fetching it? Yeah, all right, wow, so I guess we're gonna bring it in. Um, the objective of the Lynx program is to build a vehicle that will allow a spaceflight participant to have access to the space environment. You know, we're talking about 
um, a somebody who is willing to you know risk and pay for a trip into space. Um, and let's see, here it is. Uh, I'll just go over some of the key features of the Lynx and, and what makes it special and different. Um, number one is, if you notice, that's it. That's the entire vehicle. Um, we do not use a carrier aircraft. We do not use um, a drop system. We don't use a balloon. Um, this whole vehicle, this is it entirely. Um, the, the, the operations of this vehicle is you pull it out of your hangar, you fill it full of liquid oxygen and fuel, and you go. Um, and you come back, and a couple hours later, you do it again. Our objective is to have this flying four times a day um, out of multiple spaceports around the world. Um, and uh, we, uh, we are working on, uh, you know, making this uh, happen. Uh, you know, we have four engines. Uh, each engine runs on liquid oxygen and kerosene. Um, our engine technology and the cycle behind it is, uh, you know, one of the most clever systems I've seen. Um, I, I was an amateur rocketeer and still am. And, you know, I, I, I thought I knew a lot about rockets, well, a little about a lot about rockets well, when I got into it. And then I come and I look at what we're doing back there in the aft end, which I can't say anything specific about, but I can say it's clever. Yeah, it, the yeah. engine cycle is a, is a black art that I'm working on, and uh, it's sufficiently an advantage over the competitors that we can't talk about. Yeah, um, so, you know, we, 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 we have some interesting things going on, um, and it's really, uh, where we're at in the SASA project is that if you look out on our table out there, we have actual pictures of the engine system that we have for this vehicle firing. Um, you know, we've had the propulsion system uh, wrapped up and ready to go. Well, you know, of course, you know, you know, the, the you know, it is effectively uh, a uh, the TRL is very very high on propulsion. The, the, the technical readiness of propulsion is good. The pumps are still in development. Yeah. But all that's coming together nicely. The uh, the longest pole of the tent at this point is actually getting the structure going. So we've structure. Got the we're getting straights and wings and, and uh, cabin over the coming months. And so it's going to be a very, very fun year. Yeah. We've gone through two rocket vehicle developments before. We've got the Easy Rocket and the X-Razor flying. And that gives our team experience and confidence that we wouldn't have had had we not done a couple of vehicles before. And having done 66 flights of those also gave us a lot of experience. Um, yeah, and, and so, so basically what my day-to-day -day job at x is mostly structural. Um, and uh, that's what most of uh, the engineers are working on now. Our, you know, it's our biggest overhead item is to actually build the things, you know, build all the, you know, build all the containers for all the things that make this into a rocket ship. Um, I'm working primarily on, uh, on landing gear and other things like that. Um, and we have, you know, other people who are closing the cases on, you know, the wings, on, you know, various parts of the internal structure. Um, we have, I believe, it was released the, to the press that we have gotten our fuselage delivered. Yeah, we, we say a little more about that. We've got the uh, fuselage delivered. We're doing more experiments. For instance, that the, uh, the, the fuel in the straits has to be in a complex in a complex set. There we go. The fuel in the straits has to be in a complex set of tanks to control the center of gravity of the vehicle because you can't let it all slosh to the nose or tail. And the way you get those to drain properly, and it's really quite inspiring to take one-eighth of the fuel supply and take like 10 minutes to fill up this tank with a garden hose and then drain it completely dry in a little more than a minute. And it's like, okay, and they're burning 2.6 times as much oxygen as you are fuel in this thing. And oh, by the way, this one tank draining is only one eighth of the total th flow. So we're talking about, you know, you see this continuous flow coming out of this tank, and we're going to have about 20 something times that actually turning into flame in the rocket engines. And every now and then that makes my heart go bitter pat. <laughs> Let me do this back. Yeah. Um, Watching these engines run is a really cool experience. So what we do is we basically, you know, on a test day, we take our engine trailer, which there we have some photos of it, um, we hitch it up to the X4 Hummer and we drive it out to the test stand. Um, and then we all get in the bunker and, uh, you know, we do our count, we do our cycle, and when we hit the button, you hear the sound. And I can't even describe the sound. I mean, it's nothing like, you know, one of the old, you know, Saturn launches, but the difference is it's only about 15 feet outside. Um, and it is, loud and when you look at this rocket plume is a solid bar of white in your visual wheel is just you know beautiful like it looks like it's a sword made out of fire just hanging out the back of our trailer it, it, it's so 
violent that the entire trailer shook backwards until we heavily reinforced it and uh, you know, like basically locked it down. And we're going to be putting four of those things. Each one of these things, each engine is about the size of a coffee can and puts out around 3,000 pounds of thrust. Um, it's a uh, very, very, very cool little system. Okay, but I'll talk experientially, you know, what we're doing and, and kind of like, are you? Okay, I just want to make sure that our, our speaker that was actually supposed to be giving this session was not here. Um, okay, um, experientially and technically what we're doing here. Um, the Lynx is piloted by a pilot and the you can be a participant um, in the right seat. Um, if you buy a ticket on the Lynx through one of our value-added providers, um, you will be able to get a roughly five-minute exposure to the space environment in a 30-minute flight. Um, the way that that flight will occur to you is that you will be, you know, you'll be given a spacesuit, you'll sit in the vehicle, um, you'll be rolled out to a flight line, and you'll light the engines, you'll take off, and about five minutes later, you're in space. Um, you're burning the engines for about three minutes, and um, you coast up the rest of the way. Um, you get so much inertia built up in this vehicle um, from that engine burn that you know even after you're done th th running the engines, you're still going. You're still going up and you're watching that altimeter go click, 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 click. And then finally at Apogee, there you are and you just, you know, you hang. Um, and uh, at that point, you can, the pilot can, you know, upon his opinion, kind of, you know, fly the vehicle around a bit on their action control system, you know, spin it around. You have an enormous panoramic window. Um, x is really selling the view. If there's anything that um, kind of separates us from uh, competition is the fact that this entire section, this entire black section, is our window. Um, we have an enormous bubble canopy in front of you, and your doors are enormous windows as well. So you'll be able to get a full view, as far as you can crane your neck around, outside of the, uh, the vehicle. Um, you'll be able to see the entire curve of the earth. Um, we have almost, we have no obstruction out the front, the, the nose dips below, um, so you just get a straight shot right out in front of the vehicle. What's the maximum altitude? The maximum altitude on the Lynx Mark II is 300 some thousand feet or 100 kilometers. Um, that, that number is, uh, you know, we can't, we can't put a pin on it and say it's exactly X, Y, or Z because, you know, that's dependent upon, you know, the trajectory you fly. Um, but it is on the order of 100 kilometers. Um, and that, that's more or less our nominal pa participant flight profile. In addition to um, offering service to participant flight, we are actually making a uh, strong inroads into being a scientific platform. Um, the Lynx is designed for two things, you know, participants and for science. And everything about the Lynx, uh, here, here's a 5K18 engine, um, everything about the Lynx um, is, you know, configurable. We have payload options for scientific payloads. There you go. You see that thing? We'll have a total of four of these, via, these on each vehicle. Yeah. Four of these, one, two, three, four. And if you walk up to this thing, you know, it is, you, you can even put your hand halfway around it. Um, it is it is very, very small and very, very fierce. Um, and uh, it's kind of cool. Um, okay, so, so I'll talk about the science. We have a big board about the science payloads, but I'll explain where we can put things. We have the entire passenger participant seat can be removed and replaced with a rack, a standard 19 inch industrial rack. In addition, we have two exposed facilities back here and here. Um, which basically can fit a 2U CubeSat on either side um, and uh, you know, in, exposed to vacuum in the microgravity experience and actually could possibly even be ejected. Um, in addition, the Lynx Mark III will have a dorsal pod here that can hold either, hold whatever you want to put in there. We're already we have mission proposals for telescopes, we have mission proposals for third stage to launch payloads to orbit from our vehicle. Um, and uh, we also have more rack space underneath the pilot seat. Um, the missions that we would fly would be anything from microgravity, you know, uh, fluids experiments to, uh, you know, fused deposition experiments, whatever, you know, like we have quite a lot of uh, interest in our scientific payloads. I've had people come up to me on this, more or less on the street in Mojave and ask me about, oh, I have a payload, I really want to fly on links, you know, you know, how can we do that? And we actually have a whole host of uh, payload integrators signed on now. Um, so if you want to fly something into space, uh, Lynx is kind of your best bet. So what you're seeing here is a, is a nominal Lynx profile. We're test, we test the engines before flight, all four engines. The pilot's sitting there flicking the four switches um, that lets you test each engine. And now he's ready for takeoff. You're sitting there, lights them all, and boom, you're moving. 
Um, how, many, how many pounds of liquid oxygen are burning right now per second? Let's see, we're going through uh, just under 10 pounds per second of propellant per engine. Yeah. And two thirds of that is oxygen. So roughly almost 30-ish, almost no, 25 pounds per second? Yeah. 25 pounds of liquid oxygen per second, that's about like, I don't know, maybe four or five gallons, six or seven gallons? It's about 30, 30 to one, 10 of the other, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. It, it, it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of fuel being pushed through these engines. So, we're coming up on Miko, main engine cut off, boom. You're still going, you're still going up at this point. Finally hit Apogee, and uh, you know, we are, uh, here we are. The, yeah, this, the, the, this is what you're paying for. If you're a participant, um, this moment, this is zero gravity. You're in space. You're not going to stay there for long, but you're there, um, and you're one of only 500 odd people in history who have done that. And of course, that number is up. For. There's no previous vehicle has had a view like this. They're, they're, the only thing that could probably compete with this view is the cupola on the ISS, um, and, and that and that is basically a bay window that is the size of a uh, swimming pool or a hot tub. Um, and uh, if you come to Expo in Mojave, we have a mock-up and you actually can sit in the participant seat and see what it's going to be like outside of the vehicle. Um, what am I doing on time? All right. Um, actually, you know, I'm just going to put the Q&A on Expo and the Blinks project in our, okay, in our previous vehicles as well. I'll briefly mention on those. Um, we've worked on the Easy Rocket, um, which is a uh, long easy uh, it's a type of home built airplane that's been modified to run on liquid oxygen and alcohol. And then the, uh, the X series here is a variant of the long easy called the, uh, the Velocity, which is a four place long easy. We basically took two of the rear seats out. This, uh, this, that. this is the X ray. This is what I'm talking about. Um, basically, you have a pilot sitting here, and that's probably Mark Street there. Uh, here. <laughs> Um, and uh, we're hauling ass off the runway. Um, this was for the rocket racing program, um, and uh, you know it is a very, very, very cool airplane, very high performance airplane. And uh, the, the engine system we just, uh, that was designed for it um, was uh, very cool. We, we, we still have all the uh, all the engine system um, in the shop. Uh, we actually they actually took out the back two seats and put a liquid oxygen tank in there. Um, and, and when I went to go see uh, the, the, the rocket racer, I looked in there and there's a big LOX tank right behind you. And it, just, it was really cool. Um, and uh, that's, that's kind of what we're doing here at the Lynx as well. So I'm going to open up to questions about what we're doing there and uh, anything you want to know. Questions. What would it take for you guys to go to orbit? The second one is, how much of an influence would be if you could drop from the air? Okay, um, so the question, I got two questions there. Number one is about orbital systems. How, well, what would it take for us to go to orbit? And number two is about air launch. We'll tackle the first one first. Um, air launch presents operational complexities and also second ve additional vehicle design. Um, and uh, you know, seeing as we're a smaller company, it seems that you know, the lowest hanging fruit for us to pursue would be a single vehicle solution. Um, in addition, the uh, air launch benefit that you get um, is not nearly as high as one might think. Um, and, uh, you know, it predominantly, you know, if, if you contrast that against the operational complexity of having to have a whole second airframe, um, a whole separate vehicle development system, and, a, you know, an entire test program of ensuring that vehicle can detach safely and land and let land on its own, um, it did not seem like a, uh, it, it doesn't seem like that obvious of a benefit. Um, for the suborbital mission. For the suborbital mission. For, for an orbital mission, air launch makes a whole lot of sense because it makes the rocket's job a lot easier. Yes, um, because like in subor, yeah, for orbital, um, it means that your rocket won't have. If you get high enough, you won't have to chew through nearly as much atmosphere. Your aerodynamic case is easier to close on your lower on your vehicle. Um, and uh, as far as orbital systems, I know Doug has some plans on that, but I'm not sure how much we're allowed to talk about. Let's skip that. So we're going to skip orbital systems. We're not talking. <laughs> All right. I would say there's a lot of people that say the amount of energy to get into orbit is so gigantic that, uh, that the air launch is almost irrelevant except for legal reasons of getting a launch window. And, I mean, I've heard it both ways, but the other things would argue. I'll, I'll, I'll take this question. Take it, Doug. <laughs> take me down. 
Um, our chief engineer, Dan DeLong, once uh, wrote a white paper on what the advantages of air launch are, and there's about 12 or 13 features to air launch that help you. Um, it allows you to uh, optimize the rocket vehicle for acceleration in thinner air. It allows you to put a larger nozzle on the rocket engine so you get better expansion and better performance. It lets you do a launch from a different place than the uh, one fixed site on the ground, which is really important if you're going to a rendezvous with a space station. It lets you recover lower stages forward instead of having to turn around and glide back to the launch site. So there's a whole list of reasons why air launch is a pretty good idea for when you're doing a fully reusable system going to an orbital rendezvous. But the air launch doesn't have a lot of benefit if you aren't doing all of the above. If you have an expendable system, if you aren't going to a space station, and if you uh, don't have extreme timing constraints, then the air launch actually costs you a bit. And you don't get anything for free. Any additional questions? Yeah, I'm wondering what kind of training you do to take the passengers. Um, to take the participant seat, um, I'll, I'll be, there's a reason why I use that word, um, and that has to do with regulation. Um, a passenger um, is somebody who is not basically accepting that there is a risk involved in their use of that system. Is that, is that accurate? That's pretty much it. You have, yeah. you know, that, that your, if your grandma is, you know, flying to see the grandchildren, she has every right to assume she's going to get there safely. Yeah. The links, links, yeah, safe as it will be, is still an experimental system, as all space systems are. Um, it's more the, like skydiving than general commuter flying. Yeah. It, it, is still a, it is still a risky in, endeavor, you know, just because you're doing something that is very outside the realm of what's been done usually. Um, so that's the reason why I use the word participant. Actually, it is what we officially use. There's that beeping again. Um, yeah, um, it, it, it's what we officially use in what it's called your space flight participant, and that is generally the industry accepted, um, you know, title for people who are who are involved in suborbital flights. Now, what kind of training? Um, that is really up to you know whatever group that you choose to fly with, um, you know. Rocket ship tours, I know, will actually probably take you up on a uh, on a aerobatic airplane and do some stunts with you, so you can gain some experience with uh, you know the G forces that are going to be involved. Um, you know, they're going to show you and explain what's going on. They're going to take you on high acceleration jet flights as well. Um, there's also going to be some spacesuit training. You will be wearing a full pressure suit during any Lynx flight, um, and that is because you know although you know we have a cabin that is designed to hold pressure. You know, we always have to, you know, run under the assumption that any one system could fail and the mission still has to be success. So, you know, we will have, you know, a full pressure suit and you will have to get used to wearing that, get used to mobility in that. And, uh, you know, and as far as other training in that, um, um, I'll be finding out in the next year or so, you know, or the next two years, I don't know how long it'll be because then, you know, Dan will be finding out, Doug will be finding out way before me um, because every ex core employee flies. Um, and uh, that is part of the, it's one of the first pieces of paper you sign um, you know, when, when he joined the company is the, uh, is the release that allows you to fly as a flight test engineer on these vehicles. On the previous vehicle, the Easy Rocket, I believe all but two employees of the company flew. Um, and uh, I know that my friend Mark is technically the world's most experienced rocket flight test engineer. <laughs> Um, having had 17 flights in the X-ray and in the X-ray. He had 11. Between, between us, we had 17. He had 11, I had 6. Okay, he had 11. So, so, so he's still beating you. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, I wish Mark, Mark was here yesterday, but Mark is a, a stand-up guy, ace pilot, um, and uh, he's probably going to be our you know, chief flight test engineer through the initial test program. Our pilot for the, chief, for the, for the initial period is uh, Rick Searfoss, uh, shuttle astronaut, shuttle commander, um, who's landed the shuttle at least two times and flown on it four, right? Yeah, he did, he did uh, three flights, including one to the space station of Mary. Yeah, so uh, he, he's pretty experienced. Um, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I quote the specific impulse? Um, I can't remember what, we're, what we have in the spreadsheets. We, we, we calculated what it should be when, we do, when we're operating in vacuum. And then we back off a long ways from that in our performance calculations and give ourselves a lot of work. But we don't want to quote that publicly. We, yeah. we don't know what the hell the speed department will go off on. So <laughs> we don't tease them any more than we have to. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a game we have to play, you know, when you work on rocket technology. Um, 
I may have misunderstood you, but I think you said when you're talking about the dorsal pod with whatever you want to go from there, I think you said that could be a third stage into orbit? Second stage. Okay. Yeah, um, it, it basically, you know, there is going to be a dorsal pod on the Lynx Mark III. And the dorsal pod will contain uh, a payload, and that payload can include a second stage. I, I thought I was missing a stage there. Yeah, no, yeah, like, like, well, I mean, they could if they wanted to go to GTO with a tiny, like, pack of cigarettes or something, but, the, the, yeah. The nanosat launcher would be a two-stage vehicle off the lake, so that there would be a total of three rocket stages to get a payload into orbit. Yeah. Because trying to do it with two stages from Lynx's, the energy that Lynx can provide is just a lower performance method. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and, yeah, anything else? Yep. How much is it going to cost for a participant? Our, our current, the current pricing that is being quoted is around $95,000. Um, however, um, you know, we, we are working with different groups, um, you know, the two that are noted on this model, uh, Space Experience Curacao and uh, the Yichon Spaceport. Um, in Korea, um, and uh, they will be the ones offering the rides in addition to Xcor's uh, Rocket Ship Tours company. Well, Rocket Ship Tours is actually independent of Xcor, so yeah. yeah. Um, the price I mean, will come down after we skim as much off of the wealthy people as we can. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's one, it's one, and actually, we'll introduce an age of you know wealth competition, um, which is what we want. We want to be in direct economic competitive competition with our competitors. You know, that, that, that is the free market. That is the invisible hand that, that our boss talks about. So, often. so if I were to theoretically get someone to pay them a load and talk to them today, that's part of the deal. Actually, um, there are a lot of payloads that require active control during the flight, um, and uh, you know, so like let's say for instance, you're Lynx Mark III, and you have a telescope as a payload, which is a, which is a job we're already kind of contracted for. Um, we're going to have probably a telescope operator running right seat, um, and uh, that's through the Southwest Research Institute. Um, so. You know, your flight test engineer is, uh, you know, going to transform once the flight test program is complete into a mission specialist. Yeah. Do you have enough downrange potential so that Richard Branson can get to the spaceport in New Mexico? Uh, on your I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I guess. Uh, are we? What's the time like? Oh, we're at uh, 4:30 right now. 4.30, okay, um, who's our next speaker supposed to be? You. Hi, good, all right. Um, yeah, so I would like